and we are happy we are happy to be um, partnering with the Greater Newport Chamber of Commerce on this amazing presentation today. Really excited about this and excited to share it with our industry. And a shout out to Elizabeth in Warwick, the Warwick Tourism Region. Hi, Elizabeth. Nice to see you again. Wow. Um, nice and again, you thank you so much for this opportunity. We have such talent here and it's nice to be able to showcase it uh, and help our, our industry. Two things I want to mention real quick is our visitor center is open five days a week and we're looking for brochures. So if you have brochures that are industry related, please bring them by. And number two, I am happy to say that we have joined a partnership with the city of Newport and Rhode Island Public Transportation and we'll be opening the municipal bathrooms at the transportation center on Friday. Um, they'll be open daily. So it's a, a real who, believe me, talk about challenges um, in business, but it's a it's really exciting and it'll be great for the visitor and great for the industry as well. So thank you very much for this opportunity, Suzanne, and also to Kate and Erin at the chamber. And away we go. Excellent. Erin, uh, did you want to say a few words? I am just setting up a little Facebook rebroadcast here. Anyone else want to do an intro before we uh, kick off? We got a few people coming in. There we go. All right. Um, so I would like to say that feel free to utilize the chat to um, yeah do a little intro. Lauren says she does marketing for Casey's Oil and Propane in Portsmouth. Um, but excited to be here, even though she's not on video. So definitely utilize the chat if you have questions or um, want to do a quick intro. This is always a great time to uh, get to meet people. I know that the virtual piece makes it harder to actually do some networking, but it is a good thing um, to do while we're while we're together. Um, so Mark, I they believe I did you as a co-host. So if you want to queue up your slides and I'll do a quick intro, Mark Collins is uh, with On Web Local and uh, has this most amazing logo, <laughs> I have to say. Um, it does some great work um, helping local small businesses get found on Google. And uh, today we're going to talk particularly about Google Maps and Google My Business, which are really tied together so when I was writing up the descriptions for these talks, I was trying to think about like, how do I really explain like what you get with Google My Business? And it's really just to have an enhanced listing on, um, on Google Maps, which I use all the time. If I'm looking for a business, I don't go into google.com. I go into Google Maps. And I think a lot of people do that. So it's important to make sure that you're um, maximizing those searches as much as possible. And Mark, why don't you take it away? Great. Uh, first question, can you see my screen? Yes. <laughs> it's the fundamental Zoom question, right? Uh, so uh, uh, thank you all. Uh, my name is Mark Collins. The company's on web local. I've been doing local SEO for uh, over a decade, decade and a half, and uh, I've worked on hundreds of local small business websites, and I have control of and manage you know, uh, over 100 Google pages, Google My Business pages. So uh, the first thing you need to know about Google My Business is that technically, if you're a business to consumer company, your, your Google page is actually more important than your website. That's how much attention you need to give this because Google is transitioning itself from being a, uh, you know, a portal to really a destination. They're trying to make everything happen as much as they can on the Google page. Uh, you know, like with restaurants, you can already make a reservation right through the Google page. You know, if you're a yoga studio, you can link up with uh, MindBody and put their app right into the Google page, et cetera. So you really got to pay attention to it. It's really important. You know, 10 years ago, you just had to have a Google page and a Bing page and, a, and you know, and a Yahoo page, you know, now Yahoo's dead. Now maybe it's Yelp. But now the Google page is kind of pushing ahead of all those three. So uh, getting right into this, uh, we're gonna give you four quick tips to boost business uh, to, your, to your website or your Google page uh, right now. So the first, the first thing you need to know is that up until 
a few a few months ago, the only things that really affected SEO, which is the ability of your either Google page or website to show up on page one in Google, was your business name or your business category. Um, and we now have other things that can help. But the first thing is beyond your business name. So if you were XYZ consulting and you were in, uh, you know, let's say uh, maritime consulting, if your business name was XYZ maritime consulting, then you, you could rank for maritime consulting because maritime consulting keyword was in your name. So on business name, I wanna warn you, do not repeat, do not add any keywords to your business name. You have to, your business name is your business name. It has to match your business exactly. And a lot of companies have been stuffing keywords into their business name. And if a competitor reports you, your business, your Google page can be taken down permanently. So um, if your business name, whatever it is, make sure it stays the same. Don't fiddle with it. If you want to rename your business legally and change it legally and change it on your website legally, then maybe you can throw in a keyword, but I wouldn't do it. Uh, more importantly, the second most important factor for search ranking is the category. So Google has uh, recently updated categories and uh, you can now find maybe a closer match or even an exact match to what you offer. And the reason I say this is Google My Business categories have typically been terrible and now they're getting to be reasonable, but they're still not great. But a good example is in September, if you were a marriage counselor, you could now change that to marriage or relationship counselor. Now, why is that important? Because half the public is typing marriage counselor. Another half the public is typing relationship counselor to find a counselor. So that's how important that is. That actually helps you hit the keyword string. Um, maybe someone else is typing couples counseling. But um, so what you can do now is log into your Google My Business page and you can add more related categories. So for this one, the main would be changed from marriage to marriage relationship counselor. And Google will actually automatically change that for you. You don't have to change it. But you might want to add family counselor as your second category. And typically, a counselor is either a psychotherapist or a social worker, right? So number three, you'd want to add either psychotherapist or social worker if you are one of those. So that's how it all worked up until a few months ago. Now, here's the exciting part. You can add services, custom services to the page. You can also add products. Google and Google My Business is now pulling directly from that services section in the Google My Business dashboard to rank you in Google. This is huge. So this person that was a marriage counselor and a family counselor, and a social worker or a psychotherapist may also do child therapy, right? If they're in family counseling, right? And they also might wanna put the word behavior therapy because that is another major keyword that people are searching for if they're dealing with children or family issues, et cetera. So if you put behavior therapy in your site, voila. Um, if I type behavior therapy, New York City, which is NYC, Google has now added these little things. See this thing here that says their website mentioned behavior therapy? This didn't happen until you've added this word string into the Google page. And the thing you have to get here is that New York Behavioral Therapy already had the word behavior therapy on their website, but it was not on their Google page anywhere. So when they added it to the Google page, it now shows up. So the other concept you have to get is that whatever you list in custom services, basically you wanna mirror what's on your website with the Google page. So um, mirroring. So again, if you're a service business, whenever I approach a client that's a small business, I say, the first thing I see is a lot of businesses have services on one page. So if you have services on one page and you list them all, make sure you make them categories in Google, custom, custom service categories in Google. Um, 
So here's another example really quick. If you are an HVAC contractor now, you'd want to put heating contractor because that's a synonym. And HVAC means heating, ventilation, air conditioning contractor, right? So you'd want to put furnace repair because that's related. You'd want to put air conditioning contractor because that's related. You want to put air conditioning service. So these are categories. And then for custom services, you could put uh, furnace installation and you could put air conditioner installation and, and words like that. So that takes care of tip number one. Tip number two would be to add products. Now, the reason you'd add products is uh, they don't have the SEO power that the services have yet. We haven't seen putting products on the Google page generate search results any better. But what we are seeing is they're, they're a huge opportunity to get new business from people that search for you by brand. So if you have products for sale, I'll give you some real world advice. If you've got 400 products, do not add them to your Google page because there's no way to synchronize it and automatically update it. Just add five or 10 key products that are really important, your leading products. Uh, and those are the ones you want to sell to people that are searching for you by brand. And right in the Google My Dashboard, you can simply go to the Products tab, click Add Product, upload a picture, put the name, put a category, put a description, and put a price. And you can also put a link to your website page where the product is sold. If you do that, they display in mobile search now as a tab. So for this company, Bicycles NYC, they have a products tab. And when I click the products tab in mobile search, you can see the products down below. There's preview products, preview pane pictures right in there. So one other thing I wanna mention about these services and product additions to Google is that right now, they actually don't show up in desktop at all, but they do show up in mobile. And mobile searches represent 55 or even 60% of searches. So Google's actually still just rolling out this whole new thing. So what they did is they rolled it out to mobile and maps. They haven't even rolled it out yet to desktop, but that's why you've got to get in on it because it's new and it gives you an edge. So that's uh, tweak number two. Number three, here's an easy low hanging fruit that will immediately get you more business. I I'm talking about within 30 days, you'll get more business. Google allows you to export and synchronize your Google My Business page with your Bing Places for Business page. So somewhere between one out of eight and one out of 15 people is actually searching in bing.com and not even ever going to google.com. That's because they go to Best Buy, they walk out with a Dell laptop, the Dell laptop is programmed for Bing, not for Google, and they're in it for the rest of their lives. So uh, Bing is a huge, huge, opportunity to grab five, eight, 10, 10 or even 15% more visibility. All you have to do is go to bingplaces.com. And what's cool about it is you're gonna log in with your Google account with whatever Gmail controls your Google page. So if you go to bingplaces.com and log in, they're letting you log in with the Gmail that controls your Google page. As soon as you do that, It'll say, hello, do you want to import your page? Say yes, and then bang. It'll automatically import your business page, all the text fields, all the pictures, the logo, everything, and you'll be in Bing. Even if you're already there, you can do this and it will update it for you. It's a fantastic feature and it's very powerful. Tweak number four, add attributes. Google always had attributes like veteran-led business, woman-owned business. They had a couple of attributes you could add to your business. But during COVID, they added really important ones like online appointments available, or if you're a retailer, curbside pickup available. In attributes, you just go to, um, this is how they look, like this is my website. And I, I added the health and safety, the COVID stuff which you can see there, masks required, staffs wear masks, and service options I now have online appointments. 
and you can see that right in my Google page. If you Google on Web Local MA for Massachusetts, you'll see this. It's an important feature and it does show the COVID information. So for retailers, you get curbside pickup, delivery, in-store pickup, same day delivery, et cetera. And in-store shopping has always been there. So that's an important feature to add if you're a retailer. Uh, so that concludes the four tips. And there's two other things I want you to know. Uh, if you want to log in and edit your Google page, they don't actually tell you where to go. So make sure you remember this. It's google.com slash business to jump in and edit your page. And finally, if you want this whole presentation, just go to bit.ly.com slash GMB SEO tips. And you can actually see all these slides right now. So that's it. I'll open it up to Q&A now or later. Suzanne? Uh, let's do quick Q&A now. Um, that way, you know, it's all current in everybody's minds. Any questions from Mark? Or for Mark, I should say. So I think one of the big things, the big takeaways is to make sure that whatever you, um, Mark, do you want to um, stop sharing your screen? Uh, whatever, and then Rana can queue up. Um, whatever keywords you're using, the vocabulary you're using on your website. So if you're working with someone like Mark to do your search engine optimization, to make sure that you're using those same keywords in your Google My Business listing as your website. So don't throw away all that good research was a big uh, takeaway. Yeah, so basically if you have a service listed, just make sure it's a custom service if it's not a category. So the okay. big thing is that we were limited to their terrible categories. They've expanded them to make them reasonable, but now with the custom, you can actually put in your actual services and then you awesome. can rank, you can rank for those in search, which is, which is just red hot. It's just, we never had that before. Yeah. And you know, it's another way to, let's say if you're, if you're competing against somebody who is in Wisconsin, right. And they ha are putting more money toward their SEO, but still your clients are only local. This is a great way to that you know, you take that competitor off the table um, and also gets gets pretty immediate results, especially if you're a location-based business. Um, but even still e-commerce, um, you know, I'm working with a client now who has a location in Newport, but then they also have an e-commerce business. I think a lot of retail has moved in that direction with COVID. And, um, you know, these are still important things because Google is looking at all these indicators of how how this business fits within the, the Google sphere. Suzanne, that's a great point. I wanna let people know something else. If you were a strict online company with no retail store and you put up even a Google page and set the service area for the United States, it'll still help you get some business uh, from, from the state where you put up the Google page from, even though you don't show the address, it really does help you get more local business, which is, which is pretty cool. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, any questions? I have a quick question. For Mark, and, oh, go ahead, Catherine. Um, what, Google My Business has a website um, crafting tool. I think probably it's targeting people who don't have a website at all yes. and were maybe using Facebook to promote their business before. Um, what do you think about using that tool even if you already have a website? If you already have it, it's another, uh, high authority domain inbound link. It actually helps your SEO to build it. Um, you know, I used to think that it was a threat to competing with your website, but I don't think so. I really think I've done a bunch of them and a lot of people are doing them and they seem to help and support. They don't seem to compete at all anymore. They used to compete when they first came out, but now they're, they're supportive. So it's another thing you can do. But so as an SEO thing, it can help a little bit, but I'll tell you what, I barter with a mechanic up the street. He didn't have a website. I tuned up his Google page. I put up just a Google website and bang, he's ranking for mufflers, exhaust systems right in my hometown now. And he's gotten a ton of business just by making the free website. Wow. Yep. Cool. That's really interesting. All right, great question. Anybody else? 
Okay, Rhonda, do you want to queue up your slides? Okay. And Rhonda um, is from HelpMeRhonda.tech and uh, specializes, and initially specialized in working with elder people um, and getting them their technology set up. And Rhonda just gave a great NIM talk yesterday um, for NIM Live, uh, all about email marketing and a much deeper dive. So if you're interested in that, you can contact me um, and I can give you access to that. Um, but since COVID, right, you've really specialized in seeing a lot more business in email marketing, particularly with MailChimp. Um, yeah. And yeah, so, so many great tips from yesterday and you took some highlights that are easy to implement to share with us today. So kick yes. it off, Rhonda. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Suzanne was saying, is, uh, my specialty is helping what I call non-digital natives. And that includes the seniors as well as the, um, those are in the baby boomer generation, typically are the ones that I um, seem to have been drawn to me. Uh, I'm able to help them and be patient with them and instruct them in different uh, types of technology. But and in March, 2020, when the world shut down due to the pandemic, everything changed for everyone, right? And small businesses like myself, like probably your own, um, may have just had to do a pivot. And so I was fortunate enough to have been doing webinars online for uh, MailChimp and teaching my students. So I reached out to them when everything shut down during the lockdown to see how I could help them. And really um, my email list literally saved my business during that time and it continues to grow. I'm having continue to do master classes and uh, email uh, marketing type talks as well as helping people to use e email for their business. So the tips today are really gonna be showing you um, some things that first I'm gonna share some tips for before I share the tips for boosting your email, just want to sh share a little bit of statistics because um, really, why do we even want to use email now when we've got social media and other ways of, of communicating with our customers online? And every dollar spent, we can expect, this is current statistics, an average of $42 return on investment from email. Now, because emails need to get open and we get so many emails, I'm going to share some tips today on how to really get your emails opened that you're sending out. And I just, if you put in the chat, are you using email at all for your um, businesses, uh, your profession, whatever you're in uh, for your company? And if you are, are you using um, maybe MailChimp or Constant Contact, Active Campaign? If you don't mind just putting that in the chat, I'd like to get a kind of a sense of what others are using for email management systems and if they really are still using them. But as I move on now, uh, and I was mentioning, so getting our emails opened and I've been finding and that is making the emails relational as well as relevant. And that's done with a couple of tools and I'm gonna go into them a little bit is personalizing and segmenting. And so personalizing is everyone who's written an email to a friend is used personalization. It's just speaking in the language, like we personally speaking to that person, those type of emails get a lot better responses than just a canned template type email to send by, uh, you know, personally sending them from my email address versus my company's email address. Now, when we segment emails, meaning that we put emails in groups of people that, for example, that they may have a specific preference when they sign up for our list, we can ask them um, what they, pr pr they prefer if they would like to have a, get a newsletter, just as an example. A preference can also be a behavior. If someone's made a purchase, keeping them in a separate group of the type of purchase they've made, or if they've clicked on a link in an email, that would be grouping them into a specific group. Then I can use that information to reach out to them in the future so that the emails will be relevant. So the first tip I wanted to share about personalizing is uh, what is called uh, using metadata. And data metadata is just data that describes data. And so by having the first name of someone when they uh, sign up for your list or they're, they're enter your email list, then that information is in a database. And by just substituting the metadata, the first name in this case, then that can be a, 
personally addressing someone when you're emailing them. And that works very well in the greeting as well as even in the email subject. Just a little uh, proof on that, emails with personalized subject lines get 50% higher open rates. So that's definitely worth looking into is personalizing using metadata. And that can be done in another case with the first and last name. This is mainly to avoid spam filters. Then uh, for sending someone with their first name and the last name in the to field and instead you know, using the, the mer merge tags, because they're also called merge tags, metadata, then it would go to, in this case, Bob Smith instead of Bob at the, his email address. And that is a really a personalized way of doing it as well as avoids the machine uh, spamming. Now, tip number two to share is the segmenting emails. As I was mentioning about grouping people and about by their uh, preferences or behaviors. And I have a little of an example of um, what I have done with, for example, I guess um, in case, let's see, yes. And this is a, you can do that on a sign up form when someone actually signs up for your email list. And this is what I've done here, or even a survey if you already have people on your email list to find out their preferences. In my example, I've uh, asked for the email address to have to do that. Of course, it's an email. Uh, list and then the first name, really important to ask for that so we can use that personalization. And I included two, uh, a question with two choices here. And in my case, this is if, if someone who subscribes to my video, uh, my course, if they would want just the instructions or if they like video. And you know, I've gotten people that have responded to both. So now I know if I have sending out emails with just written emails, I can send them out to the people who don't really like video or use video, and then for future courses as well. So that's just an example of using, uh, getting ready to segment my emails. And then this is just how I would design the email in my particular, in MailChimp, I would send it just the email to the audiences that have that particular segment in the future when I'm emailing them. And my third tip um, is going along with something similar, but sending a welcome email. Welcome emails can be done automatically. Most email management systems do that. So if someone signs up, it automatically triggers an email to say to welcome them. And it's really amazing statistic that is a welcome email, open rates are the highest of, of all. And that's 82% of welcome emails are opened as an, as an average. So uh, very key to send out an email when someone is added to your list. And these are some real results that I have from my um, the sign up form that I was just showing you where I both welcome people, that's on the top, and then the 84% of the people open the email when they I, I tagged them when they signed up. I didn't go into tags, but that's another way of segmenting by automatically add my, set, my own form adds a tag to their, their email address that they've signed up for this particular uh, course. And the bottom one is when I sent out the segmented email for people who just were looking for the video instructions. And that, the open rates are amazing compared to I think like I said, the average open rates are about 20%. But see, we can by using these extra tools, we can even boost beyond the average open rates. I have the uh, something to mention about email versus social. Now, email click-through rates. Now, that's uh, engagement is called clicks or click-through in some cases, and as you can see, you know the far surpasses that you know click-through rate, someone clicking, actually clicking in an email once they've opened it, or clicking on a social media post and engaging with it is just a lot, you know, it's just amazing between 10% to less than 1%. So we're seeing this mainly with social media, especially with business pages in Facebook, where now they're at being asked when you post that you would boost the post. So without boosting a post, putting money into it, 
where just years ago, organically or free, everyone who follows our page almost would see the boost, but not anymore. And that's why we're seeing these click-through rates being so low on social. So the tip really is to uh, invite your friends, followers, and contacts, meaning in all the different social media platforms to join your email list because this way we have direct access to them in their inbox and uh, we can definitely get better engagement for our customers if we're using both email and social media. Very you know, simple, basic as far as the, uh, the tips are concerned, that the logistics of actually doing it, it depends upon your email management system, but I'm hoping to be able to do you know, some some workshops and other, and, and as Suzanne mentioned yesterday, a deep dive for NIM that, I, um, that went into some other ways of actually doing it instead of just giving you the tips. So if you have any questions, you wanna reach out to me as my email address as well. And I'm also at Help Me Rhonda, just plain at Help Me Rhonda on social media. So I'll stop my sharing and see if there's any questions about what I've presented or about email in general, let's say. Does anybody want to jump in with, with questions verbally? I put a couple into the chat, but if you have one that you just want to throw out there, okay. that would be great. Um, I noticed something, um, Facebook, I got an email from Facebook saying that one of my clients, um, we should remove the email signup from like the Facebook app. Uh, I guess they're no longer integrating it. Do you know anything about that or what's, or is there another way to reach out to, um, to, to promote your email list through social media that's changing? Hmm. Okay, so the email said that they removed the sign up, the, the integration. Well, from... saying, I think there's, it said they're no longer supporting it and we, it's, it's recommended that you remove the app. I think um, years ago, I must, must have done it for somebody where con there's a constant contact integration with Facebook. Uh, okay. Yes, I've used MailChimp integration as well. I have not received that email yet, but um, each email, uh, a sign-up form in this case, has its own URL, and that could be put in as a into the post, mm -hmm. and that could be pinned to the top of the page too. Right. So that's a little way around instead of integrating it. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah, I love that pinned to the top of the page. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. And other, other email related questions they don't have to be necessarily, you know, it could be anything email related. I think I've been going to digital conferences for years and everyone was saying five years ago, email's dead and email's alive and well, you know, and it continues to be alive and well. Especially yeah. during, during COVID when the email okay. rates just went through the roof, they really, and, and they, they stayed that way. Mm -hmm. It's still up 13% now as of April uh, from pre-COVID. Well, if you figure a lot of people, you know, the increase for online shopping, I would love to see if there's a statistic that relates to that online shopping versus, you know, how that all cascades down into email. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. And really it plays to the loyalty issue, you know, which leads into your reviews thing, you know, it's like, you know, the loyal customers are definitely going to follow you there. You got to, you know, you have followers and then you have real loyal people too. And then sometimes they're your best, your best source of business. You know? It's true. It, it yeah. really is about relationships just and how we can be, continue those relationships with our, our clients so that they want to hear from us and they're looking for those messages from us. Yesterday uh, it came up about coupon codes and sending out those through emails, those get a lot really well engagements as well because we're all looking for that, um, and and really doing the shopping based upon getting those codes that we can send out through emails. So that's a that wasn't a tip, but that I added to the slide deck. But it, it is a good thing to if you have a business that you can actually offer a discount, and those emails are definitely going to be looked for, and it's going to lead to sales. Yeah, and it wouldn't necessarily have to, let's say if you have a service, you could offer an additional service to only your email subscribers and promote it that way. Um, 
So I think there, that, that that answers my question of what are some ways to lure people to join an email list. Does anybody want to add into the chat some ways that you have found successful to attract people to your email list? And we can um, continue the conversation in the chat. But Ron, a quick question for you. I wanted to talk about um, welcome emails and double opt-ins. And I've just thrown in the chat that a double opt-in is like, I subscribe for an email and then it says, check your check your inbox to confirm that you want to get these emails. So that's considered a double opt-in. But what about, um, is a welcome email the same thing as a double opt-in? That's a really good question. Double opt-ins are very good to use, especially to validate that it's, it's truly a email address that's being added to your database because when you email back out and you get a lot of you know bounces, it's not good for your rating. However, when you're sending out the first email, sending it out without a link in it is really where they're getting the most opened because they're mm -hmm. not getting found in the promotions or, or maybe trash or spam boxes because if they have a link in them, then they're treated a little bit differently by the... Um, the spam police. <laughs> um, right. So that's one of the reasons that it's a little different and a double opt-in than a welcome email and how to use a welcome email versus a double opt-in. You know, not everyone uses double opt-ins or gets used to that. It's great practice, especially if you have massive amounts of people subscribing. But um, myself, I don't use them just because my, my subscriptions are, are not really, you know, anyone and everyone subscribing in massive amounts. I'd rather send out that first email. And once that first email is open, then I can send out with links or call to action in my emails. Awesome. Okay. Any other email questions? All right. We are going to jump into reviews. And um, so, Rhonda, everybody see my screen? Give me a second. Rhonda, oh, we sure. Say were you saying don't include links in the that initial email? Yes, that well, it, if if at all possible, it just to get a better uh, chances of that someone's going to receive that in their inbox. Okay. Yes, unless the person's looking for it, um, then of course they might look for it in the promotions. But if you're uh, the best practices for a welcome email is is without any links and adding some value and telling people you're going to be emailing them again with that call to action and it's going to be actually something that adds value to them as well fantastic okay so let's uh let's skip over to our next segment and turning um customers into fans and these are some ways to make reviews work all right, I have all these screens going here. Okay, so the ta first tactic is to ask early and often. And you know it's important to know that 88% of people trust uh, an online review as much as a personal review, like a personal recommendation. And about 58% of people are looking for more recent reviews. So this is where that ask early and ask often comes in. Um, making sure that your happy customers are given the opportunity to, to share their experience, right? Because so many other people are looking at that. There's some crazy statistic that says 94% of customers are looking at reviews before they make a purchase. These are all really key points to be thinking about um, as, as, you, as you're going through your business operations and to be building in um, reviews right from the get-go. You definitely want to make it easy. Um, you know, reach out to people after they've had a good experience. Make sure that you are, if you look at the, the image on the left, right, those are links to their Google page, to the yellow pages, to Facebook. You might want to think about what are some industry specific um, review sites, you know, Yelp, TripAdvisor. This really depends on what your industry is, which ones you should be going after. But you usually only want to include about three um, in there so that you give people the option. You don't want to give them too many options because then they get overwhelmed. But you do want to set it up. You want to say, you know, hey, if you've had a really great experience, we would love to see a review. It takes X number of minutes. Hang on one sec, sorry.
I picked up a non COVID cold for my daughter last week. Um, so my voice is a little bit off. So the other thing, like Mark was saying, is to use keywords and to suggest that people use keywords. If you don't have a huge list and you don't have, um, you know, a massive amount of volume, you could say, we would love for you to review us about X, or if you purchase this or purchase that, you know, you could go in and customize that, um, especially if you have fewer clients. So for example, um, I tend to be B2B in my business. And what I do is I will say to clients or partners, and I'll say, I would love a testimonial, particularly in LinkedIn. Um, and if you could mention these three things, what does that do for them? It tells them exactly what they need to do. I give them the link exactly on LinkedIn. Sometimes I do the request via LinkedIn, which makes it super easy because it'll show up in their messages. They just click on it and boom, it brings them right to the testimonial page. And I'll say, you know, if you could talk about this or this or this, again, limit it to three things, one, two, three things uh, that they would feel comfortable talking about your experience and your skill set. That's really important because it takes away that whole, what should I say piece, right? And that's really what's probably holding people up from giving you a positive review. And what it does too is now it's they're including the keywords that are relevant to my business that people are using to search for my business. Um, making sure that you're cross-promoting those testimonials. You know, you could be putting it into your email signature, making sure that they're on your website. On my website, I have a video testimonial that a client and I worked on together um, because they have been a really long-standing client, very happy. We, you know, we have been working together for, I think at that point, at least five years. And um, I had become a very integral part of their nonprofit and I felt that um, what they had to say would apply to a lot of other businesses um, who would be interested in my services. So that, that's one way to do it, you know, um, to create a little slideshow that can go out on YouTube, um, on your various social medias, video. There's so much push toward video that you might want to think about that. It's a little more effort, but there are some great tools out there that can make it easy. Um, a simple slideshow works, works also. Um, so including, you know, even just at the bottom of every page, is there a call out section on your website that you can include a testimonial, um, making sure that you are using your testimonials and your recommendations and reviews on social channels. And this is just a quick example. Um, and you can look on uh, media modifier. They have a blog all about testimonials. It has a whole ton of, um, of templates and ideas, and you probably go down to Canva. If you're not familiar with Canva, it's uh, it's graphic design made easy with little templates and things like that. And they have um, already pre-made templates like this to me looks exactly like a Canva um, out template that you could easily use. So take that quote, maybe distill it, talk about who, you know, you don't necessarily need to identify the person by name. It could be um, Catherine G, Portsmouth. Um, you know, to sort of preserve a little bit of anonymity if, if you're worried about that. Um, but these are some great ways that you can do to cross promote your reviews and then more people will see them. So the hard part about reviews, right, is that you're opening yourself up to negativity. Um, but I would counter that that negativity exists and it's better to hear about it. Um, so you can actually do something about it and actually inviting an outlet or providing an outlet for that negativity, um, it not only gives you the opportunity to address it, you'd rather hear it than have them tell 15 people, um, you know, as, as the statistic or the rule is, but also there's a, a lot of great benefits from hearing that. You're gonna learn what you're not doing well, and that provides an opportunity to do better. Um, it also, one thing to keep in mind is that the goal for reviews is about a 4.5. You don't want a five-star review. People see five-star reviews as being gained or less credible. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that 70% of unhappy customers will convert into a happy customer if there's a resolution and an apology. So this is just creating an opportunity and outlet to, um, to really just engage with people and make, make the problem right. Um, which is what all businesses really want to do. Um, also of those 15% are, 
will be more likely to buy again. Um, and 83% will respond to follow up. So you want to make sure that you're also following up and responding the right way. Now, the key here, if you look at the arrows, is to look at the dates, right? So someone left a negative review on January 19th. On January 20th, the, uh, the business responded right away. And, you know, the key really is to, um, to be gracious, to um, be understanding. Don't try to work out the problem online that tends to not work out that well. Um, you know, give us a call or we're going to direct message you. Um, try to address it as quickly as possible. But you want to, you don't want to just direct message this person. You want to also respond publicly. So you do both. You say, okay, you know, I, I appreciate that you've reached out to us and we're really sorry this happened. Um, we're going to reach out to you X, Y, Z way. Please keep an eye out or call us at this number. One thing that I would say that they could do better in this response is they say, if you wouldn't mind giving us a call at your earliest convenience, it would be greatly appreciated. You know, that really puts the onus on the customer who's already been, you know, uh, who's already upset. So go the extra mile and try to reach out to them. Um, you know, they have, they probably have this person's name, Heather, like look through your service log. <laughs> Who have we reached out to who's named Heather and say, Hey, you know, we wanted to follow up um, on our customer service and, you know, and then go into the detail to find out who that person is. Um, but also be, and then follow up with another response. Heather just wanted to respond. It was great to reach out, you know, it's great to connect with you. I'm really glad that we were able to resolve this problem. Encourage them verbally to go back on and to respond to the review. That way people can see that there's resolution. And just quickly, many, many thanks. Um, you know, I, we wanted to make these really quick and actionable and um, appreciate everyone's time. And we also have a little bit more time for questions. Anything that's non-reviews, email, uh, local SEO related is also welcome. Question that ties into um, both uh, Google My Business and reviews. Um, what about people who are like a yoga instructor, for example, who um, maybe they teach at more than one location and they work independently um, or they may, they do multiple things. Um, it may be tricky for them to have a Google My Business page, but they would like to gather, gather so it seems like the ideal place to put reviews, to, to solicit for reviews. So do you think that there's any trouble with that? Or uh, now, Catherine, that will help. You can create a Google My Business service area page. So when you first set it up, it'll ask you, do you want to display your address or not? If you say no to displaying an address, then it'll let you define a service area. So you would put, um, you know, you'd say no to the address and then you'd put, let's say, Newport, Middletown, Portsmouth, Jamestown, you know, Barrington, Bristol, Warren, right? Uh, you know, and then you would set it up and then, she, and then he or she could direct people to that page and gather reviews. And what's awesome about that is if they end up finding a studio later, you know, with a physical address, they can they can just put the address in. And you can verify that to their home address. So okay. you can't set up a Google page and use your home address displayed publicly because a competitor can report you and you can have it taken down. But you can set one up without an address and use the home address to verify that you exist. Okay, that's really helpful, thank you. Okay. Oh, Sue, so you're muted. <laughs> Could you just repeat that again? So if, let's say you, you're working from home and your business is now from home. You can't have a Google page with an address because that makes it like it's retail and Google doesn't want you not, they don't want you doing retail if you're not really a retailer, renting a business space, paying rent and being a real retailer. But you can create a page, you know, a Google page and just not list your address. That's called a service okay. area business. Okay. And it allows you to have a Google page. And I do it all the time. And by the way, since Google Plus, Google Plus, remember that? It used to mm -hmm. be like a, a social media channel. They used to have Google Plus brand pages. So we used to go build Google Plus brand pages for all the national companies that weren't local, right? Now I build a Google My Business page for my national company. 
And if it's an online retailer, I don't put an address. I just put service area in the United States. And it helps. It helps their SEO. And it allows them to gather reviews. That's really great. Yeah. Uh... And, and yeah, Lauren, yeah, oh, go ahead, Mark. You mentioned keywords in the reviews. That's huge. That's an SEO factor. So if someone leaves you a Google review and they say, you know, um, you know, you know, the yoga class was terrific. It's going to help that person rank for yoga class. Yeah, I love that tip. Yep. Sorry, Sue, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just looking at Lauren's question that she says uh, reviews always seem hard because it's not a very uh, exciting service. No one wants to talk about their oil uh, service. Any tips on how to get more reviews when verbal is a little harder? Um, so you're, you're saying you're requesting them verbally or they're, they're maybe they're giving them to you verbally and then how do you get them to move those on to online? I, like, for, I, I, I do this. I tell my clients this. Get, you want to get a review from someone that's red hot. They're really happy, right? And you catch them when they're really happy. When you do that, make sure you send them an email and leave them a voicemail. You know, if you don't get them on the phone, hi, Sally, I understand you had a good experience with our installer today. I just sent you an email. Could you please click the link and give us a quick review and mention the service that, that you know, John, the installer provided for your air conditioner, bang. And I love the idea of, of following it up with an email with a direct link so they can leave the review. Yeah, I think that's good advice. I think also to mention how important it is to your business to say, you know, sort of, if you can remember being on, on, a, on an airplane, right? How many of the airlines started saying, we know you have many choices and who you choose to fly with. And we really appreciate you being here, <laughs> you know, kind of the same the same thought process, right? Is to say, we know that you have lots of choices and, you know, we appreciate that you have selected us and we value our customers and really give them, um, you know, pump them up a little bit to say how much you rely on your customers to give you good reviews. Um, I think really the key is to make it easy and, and recommending which, what they review about takes away 90% of the work, right? If, if you think about what, what stands out to you, what stands out to other customers, um, and then how did that customer exemplify that experience? Um, and then articulating that to that customer. We know that customers are looking for an oil service that is responsive and conscientious. And, you know, I mean, even things like, like we have, old historic trees on our property or, um, you know, and we have a long driveway and, you know, if anybody comes down the driveway with a big truck, it can be kind of a thing. <laughs> like, please don't take out that big limb that crosses our driveway that like creates this canopy that we like, um, because that's been a problem. Um, or, um, you know, barreling down our driveway when we have a young child running around, um, just little things like that, I think can make a big difference and show, I think what people are looking for is real specific cases that they can say like, oh yes, I don't have big trees, but I appreciate that they think about big trees or, you know, something like that. I, I know that those seem to be rather obscure, but I think that the details is what makes it credible instead of like, yeah, they answered the phone. <laughs> um, but, but to think about like, what are the cases that people maybe had an emergency that you were very responsive to. That's another thing. Like I've, I've run through heating problems. I've, you know, we've had oil tanks, tenants let the oil run, run out, you know, now the pump needs to be primed and all this stuff. And like, you know, when you have a good experience and you were able to send somebody right out, that's I, like Mark was saying is a moment to say, Hey, you know, we would really appreciate if you could, um, if you could talk about this in a review so that other people would know. It may not be sexy, but it's important, especially when, you know, there's a big snowstorm coming and you're going to get like two feet of snow dumped on your driveway and it's going to be impossible to get an oil truck down it because <laughs> we've been there. Any other questions? 
I think, you know, you, you put up the links to, you know, right on your website where they can leave the reviews, two or three links. So like Yelp, Google, Facebook, and then, you know, with email, you know, uh, you know, you can send out, you know, the same links in an email, you know, uh, as well. And, and just use, you know, use all those tools, you know, to, to gather them, you know, and, uh, you know, they really help SEO. They're a huge factor in Google. If you have three reviews and your competitor has 20, they're going to outrank you. So uh, it's worth the elbow grease to get the reviews, especially in Google. Excellent. Um, well, I know that everyone is busy and, um, you know, has a lot of a lot going on, but just wanted to mention that I'm putting in the chat, uh, Newport Interactive Marketing has all kinds of events that are very specific to marketing. Um, they're all online now. We also have a resource library of past talks, like Mark did a whole um, deep dive last year about uh, Google My Business. And uh, that's available. Um, there is a subscription to access the, the deep media library, but the more recent talks are available for free. Um, also, you know, as you know, the chamber is a great resource um, and has lots of speakers and, you know, all kinds of um, assets, making sure that you are tapping into the new website that is specifically dedicated to shopping local is really great. Making sure that your listings are there. Um, and we know Discover Newport does a lot to bring more people to, to, uh, to the county overall and um, what great work that they're doing. So I think that, you know, with a combined effort, we all are hoping that our boats will lift this summer and take advantage of, of you know, like people are traveling domestically and, um, and moving here and making sure that the good businesses are getting the attention that they deserve. Um, and tapping into all these resources that are here to, uh, to help all these small businesses. All right, Catherine, did you want to say anything else? No, I think you covered everything. I, you know, I'm thinking to myself and listening to the presentations, maybe we should do this once a month, um, like as a tips on Tuesday or something at noon, mm -hmm. just because I think it's hard now, and you and I talked about this, Suzanne, it's hard for people to get away and, you know, where they're opening up their businesses and getting ready for that, the season and lack of staff. So maybe we should look at this either in the fall or, you know, another time. And it's something that, yeah. you know, in lieu of a marketing meeting or in connection with a marketing meeting, but I think it's, these are all great tips. And, you know, I'm glad you recorded it because what we can do is maybe send it out to our industry list sure because i know there's a lot of people that are like i really wanted to come but i just the timing is just yeah tough. and that's, that's hard that's the nature of the beast but um yeah. you know maybe we do something so that every tuesday at 12 o'clock on a special you know certain day people know that okay that's tips on tuesday so i'm going to get information to help build my business just a thought that's a great idea and i think that the q a also if people can just do a q a I find that the best, the best examples come out of Q and A all the time. Mm -hmm. The most applicable things people need usually come out of the Q and A. I agree with that, Mark. And I mean, if you can, you can um, invite people to send in questions before the meeting. Um, I mean, I, that's something I would do. I would, um, and then those speakers could just tailor the talk. Yeah, that would be great. That would be really great. Yeah, and then we can. But, you know, we have so many experts that are local um, that, you know, Mark speaks or, you know, has spoken at lots of conferences. Um, a lot of our NIM speakers, you know, are top notch. They're speaking globally. Um, so, yeah, we have all the resources right here. We're blessed that people want to live in a nice area and uh, can be location independent before it became fashionable. Um, but, yeah, we have so many great resources available to us that we'd love to make sure that local businesses are really benefiting from the expertise that that is right here in our backyard. Awesome. Okay. Well, everybody. I got a lot of great tips oh. today. Thank you. Especially Mark, the one about Bing and Google, my business connecting, uh, that that's going to be, uh, fun to try. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Awesome. Yeah. And we're all available. Um, you know, LinkedIn is generally the best place to catch me, uh, email. It gets very bogged down for me. Uh, and uh, since COVID, but LinkedIn, I'm pretty good at. Um, so you can find me on LinkedIn. 
also Mark and Rhonda. And also we have Newport Interactive Marketing. We have a, a group on LinkedIn that you can always post questions to. Um, and there's a lot of experts there who can come in, you know, it could be anything marketing related and a lot of people um, are happy to chime in and to give their advice. So that's another great resource. And uh, yeah, all right. Well, happy uh, almost summer, everybody. And we'll look forward to seeing you soon. We're going to do more, more workshops also. So let us know, um, you know, send, send uh, Kate or Catherine an email or me an email. And let me know what you would want to dive into more deeply as well. Thank, thank you, you, attendees, Bye -bye. Susan. And yeah, thank Rhonda. you. Thank okay. you, guys. Thank you. Okay, have a great day. Yeah. I don't know, I was just sharing the whole time. <laughs>